Hi, I'm Charlie. I'm originally from Waterville, Maine. I graduated from Waterville High School in the class of 2021, um, but you might be able to tell I'm not in Maine at the moment. I'm actually talking to you from the Kingdom of Bhutan, uh, which is in the Himalayan mountains. I have the privilege of studying abroad here for this semester. Um, it's been a wonderful experience to, to uh, see a new culture and a new kind of natural beauty as much as I miss uh, my home state of Maine. Um, but from a young age, um, I loved Maine. I would travel around the state on weekends with my family on day trips whenever I could. And eventually I made the goal to visit every town in Maine before I went to college, um, which I have since completed. That's over 450 different towns in Maine I've been to. And I think that experience gave me a very deep appreciation for the state of Maine, both the places we think of, the uh, popular tourist destinations, and also the more off the beaten track towns that you might not even know you're driving through that are underappreciated and that more people should intentionally visit, I think. Um, and so that's where the idea for Main Town's playing cards comes from. Um, over COVID, I decided I should combine my love of Maine with my love of graphic design and make a deck of playing cards where each card in the deck was a different town in Maine. Um, it was a fun project, but not a business at first. It took a couple years after I designed the deck until I decided to try to sell them. Um, this was when I was in college and looking for a job to do over the summer. So I just reached out to a bunch of gift stores in the state of Maine, um, asking if they would be willing to sell some of these decks, see how the um, customers enjoyed them. And that ended up going very well. Um, I've since designed two more decks of playing cards and they've been sold at a bunch of stores around Maine as well as online and I'm excited that they are being incorporated into the MLTI virtual winter conference this year. It's a super cool conference and a wonderful game that's been designed um, by a lot of really cool people for the students in Maine. Um, I, it's definitely something I wish I had the opportunity to do in high school so um, this experience where I combined you know some technology aspects with my love of Maine um, has been one of the best things that's ever happened to me. I've learned so much uh, every day that you run a small business, you have to solve new problems, and it's been such a gratifying experience. Um, and I think my advice to any Maine high school student or middle school student is um, if you have the chance to try any new ventures that incorporate technology or just any passion of yours, definitely take the chance. No matter what happens, it's going to be a worthwhile experience and you won't regret it. So. Uh, that's all I have to say from Bhutan, but enjoy the MLTI Virtual Winter Conference. Hello people of the 11th Annual MLTI Student Conference. The Maine Learning Technology Initiative provides laptops for students all across Maine to enhance their learning. For some students, having access to these devices is the first time they've been exposed to technology for purposes other than just games and social media. For me, that was not the case. For me, the MLTI laptop was more of a stepping stone. You see, I've always been interested in technology and video and have always had access to a computer. I've been working with technology my whole life. When I was in kindergarten, I would just play around with the video camera, experimenting. As I got older, I taught myself how to use Windows Movie Maker so I could add cuts and effects to my videos. Now is where the stepping stone comes in. In seventh grade, I got a MacBook from MLTI. With this MacBook, I could now use iMovie to edit my videos iMovie offered more features than Windows Movie Maker, some of which allowed me to make videos like my whiteboard videos. I also helped a local humane society by producing a few videos for them, and have made a few other short films and documentaries. All this with iMovie. But remember, iMovie was just a stepping stone. Eventually, when my school switched from Apple to HP, I did not have the MacBook anymore and was forced to move on. Since Windows Movie Maker lacked the sophistication I needed for my videos, I searched for a video editing software compatible with Windows and found HitFilm. HitFilm is even more advanced than iMovie, and with it I've been able to improve upon my videos. I've also decided to start my own YouTube channel. 
Though Hit Film is better, in my opinion, than iMovie, if I had never used iMovie, I could not have made the jump to Hit Film. I've been able to accomplish a lot in the video realm, producing over 50 videos in the last three years. But that's not all I've done with MLTI provided technology. I've used Scratch, an easy to understand programming language, and taught others in several schools how to use it on their MLTI devices. Some of those students may become the programmers of the future. Even those who don't move on to become programmers will still benefit from having a basic understanding of programming. One laptop given to me could help me accomplish all this and more, and I'm just one student. There are so many other students that could be doing amazing things with their laptops like programming or making videos, but also there are many other applications available all with the same amazing potential. There are applications for typing up essays, creating presentations, communicating with teachers and students, collaborating with other students on school projects, watching educational videos, and so much more. All that potential wrapped up in one package given to students all across Maine could be unleashed to allow students to do amazing things if they choose to use the awesome gift given to them by MLTI. Hello, my name is Linus Obenhaus, and 10 years ago, I was a middle school student. I was an eighth grader at Oak Hill Middle School in Sabattis, Maine, and that year I had the opportunity to present a video of mine for the MLTI student conference. Like anything that you did 10 years ago, it's a little hard for me to watch that video now, but the message I think still holds up and it's a nice reminder of how much I've grown since then. 10 years ago, because of MLTI, I was given access to this laptop and yes, I still have it. Uh, it does not work anymore, but I got a good eight or nine years of use out of this thing, which <laughs> Honestly, pretty impressive. When I was a middle schooler, I used this device to learn how to edit video on software like iMovie and others. And 10 years later, I still work in video production as a video editor. I work for a company called Complexly. We create educational content for YouTube. We produce shows like Crash Course, SciShow, Bizarre Beasts, PBS Eons, and others. Now, since my middle school days, I have upgraded my tech a little bit. This is my current laptop. It's a... Uh... <laughs> quite a bit thinner than the uh, old one and it even has a case on it so it's even thinner than it looks. Now I also work on this PC and sometimes this Mac Studio and I have a bunch of monitors and this fun little wheel and I've upgraded my software. Now I mostly work in Adobe Premiere Pro and After Effects but it's really not that different from the software I started on. Like 99% of editing is just choosing the length and order of clips and tons of free accessible software can do that. For me, having that computer in middle school was actually super important to laying the foundations for what I do now, and often in ways that I didn't really expect that it would. I used to spend countless hours placing building blocks of code in Scratch just for fun, and I didn't realize that when it came to write some basic code for animation that it would be a lot less intimidating for me. So whatever cool tech you have access to, use it and make something that you think is cool and interesting. You never know when it might come in handy down the line. Plus, making stuff is just fun. <laughs> We're allowed to have fun here. All right, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your conference.
I'm sure that you've all heard the term bandwidth and speed. And you've probably also heard bandwidth compared to capacity. And speed is often compared to how fast something is. Well, think if you will about this simple diagram where the circles on the top represent, let's say water pipes looking directly at you. Fast a cross section is. of a water pipe. Obviously, fast the pipe is. to the far right can carry more water fast something is. than the pipes to the left. Fast something However, is. it doesn't mean that that water is necessarily fast running is. fast. If fast you look at the diagram is. below the circles, it is a highway. Fast and you can is. see that the one on the left is a two-lane highway. Fast and the one on the right is. looks like, oh, one, two, a three-lane highway. Fast something is. Obviously, the highway on the right can fast carry more cars is. than the highway on the left. Fast something is. This is bandwidth. As we think about speed, some of the things that come to mind are speed limits. Those are often measured in miles per hour, or in some countries, kilometers per hour. Maybe in a science lab, you've heard the measurements of feet per second, meaning a distance over time. How many feet does something move every second? In the metric system, that might be meters per second. You've probably also heard of revolutions per minute. How many times something turns per minute or per second um, or even shorter than seconds? Interestingly, sound moves at 343 meters per second, which is equivalent to 700 miles per hour. So fast enough that you, you hear it as soon as I speak it. Perhaps you've been on a golf course when you hear a ball hit and you're a long ways off. And it takes just a split second for the sound to reach your ears that the club hitting the ball makes. When we look at light, light travels at 299,792,458 meters per second, or 186,000 miles per second. Now that's fast, and it is obviously the reason we use fiber optics, because if we can move data information over light, it can go very, very fast. And speaking of data, data is a system of ones and zeros. The smallest piece of data is considered a bit. Eight bits is considered a byte. A thousand bytes is considered a kilobyte. And so on and so forth, kind of like the metric system. So a, a million kilobytes is considered a megabyte and gigabytes and terabytes and it goes on and on but data information is represented by a series of ones and zeros now when you're using technology as you are right now um, and as you use it at home there are different um, variables that make something that make data move faster or slower some of those variables are uh, wireless copper telephone cable, uh, satellite dishes, how fast your um, router might be or how old it might be coming into a home, cell phone towers and how fast the provider is allowing the data to move through. All of these make a difference on how quick the internet is, how fast it is and how much of it can go to one particular area. While it's probably natural to think that our country has a very fast internet, and it is fast, as you can see from this chart, 
it is not as fast as many other countries. Now, a paradox is something that seems like it should be true, but maybe it isn't true. And when it comes to chickens accessing the internet, I do wonder if all places in Maine have the same speed. I mean, northern Maine, southern Maine, east, west, and central Maine. We do have a very diverse state in geography and different population centers. So it makes me curious if the speeds are the same. So in this exercise, we're going to test that a little bit. So as part of the winter classic for MLTI, we have an activity designed to capture and record statewide internet speeds for this particular date and time. Now, many variables can determine whether a school internet is fast or slow that particular day. The things we mentioned before about wireless or things going on on a network, uh, there's, a, there's many variables as to how fast a connection might or might not be. But if we tested it out statewide using the opportunity of having all of you logged in all over the state and recorded that on a spreadsheet, well, maybe we could make some sense of it. So here's your Speed Lab materials. You need a laptop with a browser and you need the data sheet. The link is provided above. And you need to go to Google and just type in the search speed test. It will come right up and you can take a speed test. What I'd like you to do is take multiple speed tests and find an average within your group or within the classroom that you're in. So if every person did this three times on their machine and you took the average of those three, that would provide us some information to enter in our spreadsheet. Okay, so on your data sheet, there, you will see columns for your school name, the town that your school is in, the number of people in your group that ran the test, and then um, the average download and average upload speed for your group. Again, you might want to take this a few times and remember that uh, you want the average, not your highest score of the group, but your average. I also put in two columns if your teacher happens to have a cell phone and they could do the same test from their cell phone. We'll be able to compare across the state who has the quickest internet speed at that particular time of testing. Have fun. We hope to see you at Tech Camp on May 23rd at the University of Maine. Sign up if you haven't. See you then. Hi, I'm Tom Bickford, the Director of STEM Outreach at the University of Southern Maine, and I'd like to introduce you to the Maine STEM Film Challenge. What is it? Well, it's a program where students from across Maine create short videos on any STEM topic. And there are specific rules that you'll have to follow, but all of that's available in our rules document available online. We have divisions for second grade and younger, grades three through five, grades six through eight, grades nine through 12, and any students enrolled at college. Basically, teams can be from one to 10 students. There has to be an adult mentor. 
and you can have more than one adult mentor, you have to complete a video that's anywhere from three to 10 minutes in length. It has to have a title section, it has to have your content, and then it has to have credits at the end. Videos can be in almost any video format, and that's specified in the rules. Every source that you use to make your video, including the people, must be attributed in the credits at the end. Your topics can be any STEM topic from science to engineering, technology, mathematics, or STEM history. So you have a lot of latitude on what you'd like to cover. When we take a look at the films, we evaluate them 40% on how the content is in them, that's the data and the, and the facts, then 40% on artistic delivery, another 10% on meeting some technical specifications, and 10% we take a look at how accessible it is for people watching the video. Awards are to each of the five major divisions, as well as a, an award for the most creatively presented STEM film, and also for the most accessible STEM film of all the submissions this year. You can find all the information on our website, and that includes videos from prior year's winners, quick links to the rules and forms, a discussion of what STEM is and a lot of possible topics to pick from, and resources you can use to help make your film. Be proactive. Don't wait. Just give us a call or send us an email to msfc at maine.edu or visit the website at usm.maine.edu backslash STEM and then select the film challenge from the menu. We hope to see you, and now please sit back and enjoy a short video from last year. Only one out of 10 dogs born will find a permanent home. There's about 200 million stray dogs in the whole world. I have stray dogs for a well, that's a great question. Stray dogs damage property, typically guarded with their feces, also known as poop, and litter the streets by, by overturning dustbins, which also increases the risk of disease and encourages rats. Domestic animals may be injured or killed by packs of stray dogs. 33% of all adopted cats and dogs are strays. How do you tell if stray dogs are stray? Strays are typically more fearful than a federal dog and are more likely to show symptoms of such fear as snapping, biting, and avoidance. It's estimated that cats kill 1.4 billion birds each year in the U.S. alone, with 69% of these kills are feral or stray cats. Only 10% of the animals received by shelters have been spayed or neutered. Overpopulation due to owners letting their pets accidentally or intentionally reproduce sees millions of these excess animals killed annually. 25% of the dogs that enter local shelters are purebred. How can we help stray dogs and cats? Well, that's a great question. Well, instead of going to a puppy mill or a breeder, we could go to an animal shelter where there are hundreds of dogs and cats that need homes and die there, or just just never get adopted. Wow, and that's great. We can leave food for stray dogs and cats. We can also get them as, well, have them as pets and take them to the vet and get shots and checkups. Adopt more cats and dogs from the shelter.
place where dogs may attack humans, often as a result of previous traumatic experiences. Here are some animal shelters near us. Pause the Camden Animal Shelter is where I got my pet. Another shelter where you can get your pet from is the Ark Shelter. Right now. Penobscot Valley Humane Society is another animal shelter you could adopt from. Hope Memorial Humane Society is where I got my pet in Thomas and Mason.